center. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. All right, great. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kristen Nowak. I'm a water resources scientist at Wood Environment and Infrastructure Solutions in Tampa, Florida. I've been there for 13 years now. Today I'm presenting on stream and wetland restoration on agricultural lands, a case study with broad application. And I put this presentation together with my colleagues, Dr. John Kiefer and Shelley Thornton. Next slide, please. Here's an outline of my talk. Um, the case study I'm presenting is the Mayaka River Headwaters Restoration Project. So I'm gonna introduce the project team, the project area, project goals, design and construction details, and the project benefits. Then I'll touch on hydrologic alteration in Florida and how the approaches used in this case study can have broader applications such as two urban watersheds. And lastly, I'll go over water quality benefits that can be gained from doing stream and wetland restoration. Next slide. So as I said, this is the Mayaka River Headwaters Restoration Project, and this is the project team. I included our headshot since this is a virtual pl platform, and the project was funded by Mosaic, and Shelly Thornton is the project manager on it, and she also sits on CHINEP's Technical Advisory Committee, or TAC. The project was designed by Wood's stream team, which is led by Dr. John Kiefer in the glasses, very looking like a professor, and that's me to his right. Um, most of the time you'll probably see us covered in muck or wearing waders. And the project was constructed by Plants by Profit, who do amazing work. They've built thousands of linear feet of streams for Mosaic, many of which have been designed by our stream team. Next slide. So here are two maps showing the project location in a regional context. The left slide is a streets map and the right is an aerial map, but they both cover the same area. That long blue line on each of the maps is the Mayaka River, which is 66 miles long and flows from the top where you see that red star. Um, and that's representing the project area. And I pointed out some areas on the map um, that the river flows through like Becker State Park, Flatford Swamp, and the Mayaka River State Park. And of course, the Mayaka ultimately drains into the Charlotte Harbor. The red star is the project location. And you can see why it's called the Mayaka River Headwaters Restoration since it's up at the top or the head of the watershed. And the watershed has a total drainage area of 580 square miles. And just to note, the Mayaka River is designated as both an outstanding Florida water and a Florida wild and scenic river. And it looks like the red star is actually a little further, like lower than it actually is. You might see like a smaller blue star up there and that's the project location. Next slide. So here's a much more zoomed in map of the project area. And that orange line you see there is the Mayaka River Basin. So you could see how high up in the watershed we are. That blue line is the Mayaka River and in this area, it's flowing from the middle right of the image southwest towards the bottom left corner of the image. Those two blue shaded parcels that the river th flows through are two tracts of land that Mosaic purchased to conserve a 207 acre portion of Mayaka River's headwater corridor as offsite mitigation for the Wingate, Wingate East Mine. So the mine boundary is shown in white and it's to the north of the um, project area, which is those blue shaded areas. And if you look at the bottom left of the mine boundary, you'll see a large green area and that represents preservation land. So land that's not going to be mined and that is um, directly adjacent to the project area. So when you combine that preservation land and the project area, um, there's th um, permanent preservation and extensive buffering of 1.5 miles of the Mayaka River. So portions of these lands um, were in agricultural use prior to Mosaic purchasing them as are many lands in this watershed. So the goal of this project was to ecologically improve about half of the property through stream restoration, wetland restoration, and upland restoration. And um, for purposes of this presentation, we're going to focus on the 87 acre parcel um, on the east. Next slide, please. So zooming in closer to that east parcel, here are two side-by-side -side maps showing the land use of the existing conditions versus 
the proposed conditions. So we'll talk about the existing land use on the left first. The dark green is the forested wetlands that are on the property and the light yellowish color is pasture land. The orange and pink lines that you see throughout there, those are ditched areas. Some of them are going through wetlands, some are going through uplands, and then the blue line is natural stream. So the long blue line you see coursing through there, that's the Mayaka River. Um, on that left image, you see on the far right side that there's a pink line, and that's part of the Mayaka River, but it's a ditched portion of the Mayaka River, and it's a pretty substantial area. Then on the right, in the proposed conditions, you see that that pink ditched portion of the Mayaka River turns blue because we um, restored that area. And we'll be talking about that in detail. And you can see other areas that used to be pink ditches that have turned into blue um, natural streams now. And the last thing to note about the um, proposed conditions map, um, there's some created wetlands in the area six. You'll see that there's different labels for the different locations. And I'm gonna talk about a few of those areas in more detail. And then um, where the pasture land was, that turns more to an orange color and those pasture lands are being restored to upland pine flatwoods. Next slide. So for the next series of slides, I'm going to go through a few different areas and do like a before and after. Um, since this project has actually been built, so it's in the ground. So we have some great before and after shots. So this is area one, the before shot of the ditched portion of the Mayaka River. It's bordered by pasture and abandoned floodplain. Next slide. So this aerial image was taken by drone um, last spring, right before construction was starting. You can see the Mayak River ditch um, going straight up the middle of the image. It's just to the right of those trees. It looks like um, a straight brown line, basically. And that's um, it's a black water system, so the water's kind of tannic. And those trees on the left are actually the abandoned floodplain. So that's actually where the river used to course through before it was ditched. Next slide, please. And here's the after, um, pretty stark comparison. So um, this image was flown right after the construction was completed, which was this past winter. 700 linear feet of meandering stream were built to the right of the ditch where there used to be pasture and a new valley flat was built. And that whole area in there um, had to actually be lowered by three feet um, so the stream could be reconnected with its floodplain. When the ditch used to run through the left floodplain, but when it, was, when it was ditched, that ditch was dug to a much lower elevation. So we ended up having to design to a lower base elevation. If we wanted to reroute it through the left floodplain, we would have to lower that entire floodplain for the stream to be reconnected with its floodplain. So rather than destroying that whole forest, we decided to take it out into the pasture where there wasn't anything to impact. Um, the only thing there was out there was a large oak tree, which you could see kind of to the top right of the stream, and we were able to avoid that one altogether. Next slide, please. Here's a closer on the ground view um, that John Kiefer took using his really fancy camera pole that he has, and you could see him on the right with his pole. Um, if you look on the foreground at that first bend, on the outer right part of it, you could see we added root balls um, that act as tow wood, and that really helps armor the bank and provides habitat. And I love looking at this view because you can see the new valley flat or floodplain that's able to accommodate the overbank flow. So think about the river going over its bank and that whole area being able to, you know, accommodate the flood flow. And that's how streams are supposed to function naturally. So the hydrology here was restored because now the water routes around these bends and during high flows interacts with its floodplain rather than just shooting through a deep ditch where it was completely divorced from its floodplain and it's not getting any you know, water quality benefits. And everything we did in this design was using natural channel design and we um, did it for the appropriate watershed size using regional data on stream um, restoration that our team has published a guidance manual on. Next slide, please. So this is area two. It's a little further um, in the more natural part of the Mayaka River. But as you can see, it had unstable banks. It was relatively straight and had sparse vegetation. So 
you know, I think there was some grazing going on here. And what we noticed in this area that while there wasn't as much room to work with as there was in area one, there was some room that we could fit some individual bends in to create a more reandering flow path and help to dissipate energy. Next slide. So here's John with his pole again, and he was able to shoot this bend sequence that was created. And no trees were harmed in creating these bends because the construction stayed out of the root zone. We're able to fit it into the existing landscape. We used Florida morphology for the watershed size, um, thinking about things that stream designers think about, like radius of curvature and sinuosity. Next slide. And here's a really great drone shot where you could see how the bends were strategically placed to work around those trees. And that pink line you see on there, that's where the existing straight run used to be. And these created bends help dissipate energy within the channel um, by having it course around pools and ripples. It lengthens the flow path and creates habitat. And I just, I love the, you know, how much more stream there is now. Next slide. So this is a different area of the property. It's on the south side of the parcel. It's called Area 3. And it's a ditch tributary that flows into the Mayaca from the south to the north. As you can see from these pictures, it's much more confined in here in terms of there are a lot of trees to work around. Um, but there was a sparse understory. Next slide. So what we did in this area was we increased sinuosity using strategically placed large woody debris structures and retrofitting bends in some of the more open areas to make this ditch more streamy. Because of how much more confined this area was, we had to be much more surgical in our approach. So a structure we really like to use in areas with limited space is called a wing deflector. And that's what you see in the top right image. It's built using logs um, that are placed in the shape of a triangle that project out into the stream. And what happens is the water is redirected around the logs and it induces a bend and creates a bend pool downstream. And the bottom right image is where we're able to construct a bend, again, without harming any trees. Next slide, please. And here's John with his pole again, and he got me in this one because I get used for scale a lot. <laughs> and this is one of the constructed bends and the area above the water line that you see, um, which would be called the inner bend, that's actually where the ditch used to go through. So that area was, was completely filled in and you no longer realize that was a straight ditch. Now it has a nice natural looking bend. It was planted and you know, like now when you walk through this area, you feel like you're walking along a stream instead of along a ditch. And you could see off to kind of my right that we added some woody debris habitat, just some large woody debris for macroinvertebrates, fish habitat, that kind of thing. And we did that throughout the river. And I completely forgot to mention, and this just made me think of it, but in the area one where we did the 700 foot long meandering stream, I forgot to mention that we completely filled in that ditch. So once the water was rerouted through there, that ditch went away. It was um, the spoil, from building down the floodplain was used to fill in that ditch. So I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that. Next slide, please. So now I'm gonna jump to area six. This area is a little different. Instead of using stream restoration, this was a wetland restoration area. This was an area that was pasture, but we actually found some hydric soils in there. And there was a cattle pond and a drainage ditch. Next slide. And here's the fun drone shot. What we did in this area was create three wet prairie wetlands, which are shorter hydroperiod wetlands. We designed them to be shallow based on where we are encountering those hydric soils. So since this was offsite mitigation, we wanted to create some additional wetlands for additional storage and water quality benefits. So Mosaic got this great aerial shot where the east wetland was holding at water shortly after it was built. If you look closely in there, you can see different plantings. And I just love that it also happens to be in a heart shape. And the cattle pond that was out there was filled in and the ditch that drained um, one of the existing wetlands in this area was blocked off to restore the hydrology in that wetland. 
And if you look closely, that circle, that's the drone operator. And that's, that's not John, though. Next slide. So some stream and wetland restoration benefits of this project is that the project harnesses and redirects ditch water in ways to provide flood protection because it dissipates energy within the channel in the pools that now exist and along the channel by reconnecting its floodplain. So it's doing some in-stream dissipation of energy and overbank dissipation of energy as well. Um, it increased biodiversity because the restoration creates habitat for macroinvertebrates and fish. And it improved water quality because more oxygenation as the water flows over ripples and nutrient cycling as the water interacts with more with its floodplain and has a longer flow path. And as John likes to eloquently put it, the restoration project is the tale of letting water do its dance again, instead of short circuiting and carrying everything with it straight to the sea. Next slide. So why does hydrologic restoration matter? Chinep's 2019 CCMP states that hydrologic alterations have profoundly changed the dynamics of freshwater flows, which have impacted water quality, aquatic and riparian habitats, and the living things they support. And one of the major goals of the plan is to protect and restore natural flow regimes, particularly protecting and restoring headwater tributaries. Julie Esp from FDEP shared a slide at FSA last year that there are 27,000 miles of streams and rivers in Florida, and there's 43,000 miles of canals. 30,000 of which are impaired or, or are included in an impaired WIBID. These hydrologically altered canals and ditches, they don't have the natural processes in place to combat these impairments. Next slide. So in Charlotte Harbor, some of the major challenges are water quality impairments and red tide. The map on the right shows various TMDLs and verified impaired water bodies with nitrogen and bacteria among the main pollutants. The map shows the major basins, and of course the one from this case study is focused on the Mayaka River Basin, which does have its fair share of impairments. As far as red tide, which um, many of the presenters have talked about already, we know a couple years ago there was a very intense bloom with a long duration that had significant economic impact and bad news traveled by social media. So if canals and ditches act as short circuits to the sea, then restoring them to function more like natural streams should help with these water quality issues. So that's one of the you know, broader implications and applications of this project. Next slide. So an opportunity exists to apply the approaches we shared in this Mayaka River Headwaters project to other areas because this case study offers a range of opportunities. And these range from, you know, working in a limited space. We showed that when there's limited space to work in, you can use a more surgical placement of different structures that help guide the flow. When you have a moderate space, um, such as we did in area two, you can fit individual bends in. And when you have ample space, you could create an entire valley with a meandering stream like we did in area one. And this can apply to various areas too, not just rural lands. So, you know, you could, Go to other agricultural lands, as many of these do have significant amount of ditching, which has been going on um, basically since the 20s. Suburban areas where often the issue is more in size channels that no longer interact with their floodplain. And that happens because of a lot of the stormwater inputs and the impervious services. And then in urban areas, you have larger canals often acting as flood conveyances, which Luzon alluded to in the last presentation. Next slide. So I wanted to take a closer look at urban watersheds because we know that these get a lot of runoff and contribute to water quality impairments. Um, urban watersheds often have many miles of canals, which are expensive to maintain and repair. They, ex they export sediment downstream when they have eroded banks, and they often are unattractive and devalue surrounding properties. But these areas actually do provide an opportunity because they typically have an existing right of way that you could actually be surprised how much you could fit into these. So let me show you in the next slide, please. Okay, so this is a side by side comparison. On the left side, you have a typical urban flood conveyance and associated right of way. 
And on the right side, you have a design that takes this right of way and fits in a meandering stream and floodplain using a um, tiered stage channel approach. So let me explain this a little better. On the top left, what you see is a large trapezoidal channel with a bank angle that's sometimes held in place by riprap or concrete blocks. And this slope takes up quite a bit of space. And on the bottom, you have your straight ditch in blue with the slope banks on either side. And in these conveyances, you often just have a flat channel bottom, which lacks vertical, vertical heterogeneity like pools and riffles that are important habitat and energy dissipators. So let's compare that with the right side. In this scenario, you can use that right of way to create a meandering channel. So you kind of build from the bottom up. You build your channel, and then you could build your valley flat or your meander belt, which is the, um, the horizontal area through which your stream can wiggle through. And then you slope up the hill slope, and you could even provide another stage or tier that can accommodate a trail or a travel way. This option is much more functional from an ecosystem standpoint, and it's more aesthetically pleasing, of course, and offers recreational benefits. And as you can see in both scenarios, they both still accommodate the um, large storm floods. Next, next slide, please. So this is an example of an urban watershed project that our team has done applying this multi-stage approach in an urban watershed. It's Alligator Creek up in Stark, Florida. You could see in the DEM maps on the left, um, on the top one, you could see just a straight channel. That's the light blue color. And this ditch was bringing excessive sediments downstream into, I think it was Lake Rowell. And so we designed a multi-stage channel on the bottom left. You could see that um, blue line turns more wiggly like a stream. And it meanders, has pools and riffles. And rather than the water just short circuiting through a large ditch, it now has the opportunity to meander, inter interact with its floodplain during overbank events. The project was built a couple of years ago. It's provided a great example of what can be done in an urban watershed. The image on the right is staff from Sarasota County checking out the project. Next slide. So stream restoration has some quantifiable water quality benefits. In Virginia, their Chesapeake Bay TMDL outlines some restoration protocols, including bank stabilization, since Stabilizing banks can help prevent sedimentation associated with bank erosion. Hyperreic exchange during base flow because having appropriate groundwater surface water interface is important for dissolved gases and various organisms. Floodplain reconnection. It's natural for a stream to go over bank for some time throughout the year and dissipate energy for nutrient cycling and to support riparian wetlands. And then the last bullet they mention is regenerative stormwater conveyances, RSC. Um, and I don't know a whole lot about this, but basically those are flood conveyances that are designed in a way to treat stormwater. So not just to, um, so they're like a value add type of conveyance. And again, borrowing from Julie Espy's presentation last year, FTDP's viewpoint on stream restoration is that TMDLs and BMAPs are not always the answer to water body restoration and stream restoration offers a water quality restoration alternative. There's, of course, a need for demonstration projects to actually quantify these benefits, which would be an iterative process. And with better understanding of the benefits, DEP can better allocate funds for grants, like surface water quality assistance grants. And next slide. And that's it. So I'm happy to answer questions you may have. There's John with his poll again. So if I can't answer anything, I left um, his email and you can feel free to email any of us your questions and I'll go through the questions you've left me today. Well, great. Thank you very much, Kristen. Um, we're now gonna go to the Q&A session and it looks like we already have several questions. So feel free to start answering them. Okay. I'll just kind of start from the left. Did this project use historical aerials or soil maps in GIS to determine how to return to past conditions? So um, yes, that's always part of our, our, our process in doing our stream restoration projects. We always gather 
um, you know, all the available information. Um, we look extensively at historic aerials. We take into account the soils, the slope of the land, the topography. Um, in that area six, we, we could tell that um, the existing wetland out there most likely was a marsh, but now it's turned shrubby and needs to get burned. So we even had in the plan some things for burning, which I didn't get into at all. But yes, we always, we always start with the historic and try to get it as close as possible. And then we have to work with, you know, what our existing conditions are today. Let's see, what year was this stream restoration completed? It was completed this year. So it was begun last spring. I want to say they broke ground in April, maybe. And then I was out there this March, and that's when the stream was reconnected, and I got to see it flow for the first time through the Mayaka River. Were pre- and post-water quality monitoring being done? Um, I'm not sure. I know that there was water quality monitoring being done during construction, of course, you know, to make sure there was no turbidity, um, anything going on there. Let's see what else. Have you calculated nutrient reductions for our projects? Um, we have, we've done that for some projects, yes, and that, that TMDL from Chesapeake Bay helped um, set those calculations. And I know we're working on them for Florida specific to, you know, hopefully someday be able to get credits through DEP. So that's been kind of a joint effort with them. Um, you mentioned using regional data to figure out how to design the stream. What did you use? So um, our stream team did a lot of research back in the day, um, looking at streams throughout Peninsula of Florida. And we put together guidance which is called regional, regional curves of Florida. And that basically allows you to figure out the width and depth of a stream and all kinds of various design components um, using your watershed area. So you always wanna fit your stream to your watershed. And um, we have a guidance document out. It's Kiefer et al. 2015, I believe. That seems like it was a long time ago, but I guess it wasn't that long ago. Um, you could find it on the FIPPER website. Um, is it a good idea to keep trees on the banks of canals to offer stability to the banks? Absolutely, yes. Um, anytime you could have natural armoring, the, the trees are sometimes the only thing that holds the banks together. <laughs> okay, obviously converting urban ditches to natural channels is good for the environment, but what about the wallet? What are the financial reasons our governments would pursue converting urban ditches to natural channels? That is an excellent question. Um, stream restoration is expensive, but there are a lot of um, financial benefits to it, such as um, decreased sediment loads. So when you restore the banks and stabilize the banks, there's a lot less sediment going out that later has to get dredged. And um, we did a great study for Philippi Creek um, for the, that watershed in Sarasota County, where we did put together these different financial benefits, um, nutrient reductions, et cetera, using calculations to put actual costs on those. And there are financial benefits and, and the recreational opportunities um, that might be brought to the area. Let's see what else. Did we find any interesting fossils or native artifacts? Um, we did not. I, I have seen, you know, shark's teeth and stuff in other areas on the Mayaka, but not, not up here in the headwaters. Why wouldn't filling the ditch be sufficient to force the stream flow into the historic flowway and floodplain? Okay, so that's a really great question. So we would have loved to use the historic flowway, but because the ditch was dug so much deeper, if we were to route it up into the historic floodplain, it would end up flooding the upstream areas because um, you'd have to raise the, the level back up. So we did look into that and we did modeling, but unfortunately we weren't able to, to route it in that way. We would have had, what we found was we would have had to lower that entire floodplain and destroy that floodplain forest. So we you know, looked for ways to avoid doing that. 
And are there any before, after species assessments, bioindex surveys done to pair with the project? Um, we did habitat assessments and, and I'm trying to think of what else, but yes, there are a couple, couple um, indices that we use that we can do pre-post. 